Hello, I'm Christiane Klein in New York, and welcome to a special edition of Time Tunnel. With the John Benet Ramsey murder back in the headlines, today we travel back to 1999, three years after the six year old was strangled. ABC's Elizabeth Vargas talked with Linda Arndt, the Colorado detective who first handled the case, and she had her own suspicions about who the killer was. I'm John Benet. Oh, hello. Nearly three years after the murder of John Benet Ramsey, the case remains unsolved. But the detective who first handled the case has no questions about who is guilty. I know who killed John Benet. There's no doubt in my mind who killed John Benet. And until, while this investigation is still ongoing, I don't think it's appropriate that I, I say that name out loud. Linda Arndt was the first detective on the scene at the Ramsey house on December 26, 1996, the morning John and Patsy Ramsey had reported their six-year-old daughter, John Benet, missing. Arndt was the only officer there for much of the day. She later would be roundly criticized, vilified in the press as responsible for a bungled investigation. Now she's speaking out to set the record straight, telling her side of that dramatic day three years ago. It all began with a call at 6.30 in the morning from her sergeant. He said there's been a kidnapping. It involves a six-year-old girl. There was a ransom note, a two-and-a-half-page ransom note. And according to the ransom note, there was going to be a phone call from the author, and they were supposed to call between 8 and 10 a.m. So I was supposed to get to the house for purposes of monitoring the phone call. 8, 10 a.m., Arndt arrived at the Ramsey home and meets John Ramsey for the first time. How did he strike you? Cordial. Cordial? Mm-hmm. Upset? Cordial. Distraught? Cordial. Did it strike you at all that he was that that was behavior that was unusual for somebody whose child was just kidnapped? It's been my experience that people respond to trauma in different ways. So if someone has a response that is different from mine, I don't put judgment to it, I'll just, I'll just note it. And that is what she says she did all morning, make mental notes of all things curious, including, she says, the fact that Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey remained apart in separate rooms for most of the day. That at one point, she says John Ramsey took time out in the middle of the crisis to read his mail. I remember seeing John in the kitchen, looking through his mail, and I, I made a note that he was looking at his mail, and then I wondered, where did your mail come from? Isn't it possible maybe he was opening the mail looking for a clue from the kidnapper? I don't know. And I, and I don't speculate. Um, it's a piece of information that I see. It's uh, something that I know. You thought it was unusual, however. I can say that it stuck out. 10 a.m., the deadline imposed by the writer of the ransom note for a telephone call. 10 o'clock comes and goes, and there's no acknowledgment within the house from anyone that the deadline imposed by the author of the ransom note has come and gone. Nobody said it's 10 o'clock and the kidnappers haven't called? Nobody said that. Was that something else you took note of? Absolutely. By 10.30 in the morning, Arndt was the only police officer in the house with John and Patsy Ramsey, their pastor, and four family friends. As they waited for news, the tension was mounting. Arndt called her station house for backup repeatedly, but none had arrived. How many times did you call the police department asking where your backup was and what was going on? Well, I remember at least two calls. Both times I was told everybody's in a meeting. Um, they got your message, and uh, that was it. Were you feeling pressure being in charge of a group this large and with anxiety that high? I felt tremendous pressure. 1.01 p.m. Although the house had already been searched by patrolmen before she arrived, Arndt says that in order to break the building tension, she asked John Ramsey and his friend Fleet White to search the house again, top to bottom, looking for anything out of place. She says she gave them specific instructions not to touch anything. She says John Ramsey headed straight to the basement. She heard Fleet White scream for an ambulance and then a chilling discovery. For Arndt, the pieces of the puzzle fell into place. And I see John Ramsey 
carrying Jean Bonnet up the last three steps from the basement. And, um, and my mind exploded. And everything that I had noted that morning that stuck out instantly made sense. And Jean Bonnet was clearly dead. Then she's been dead for a while. I ordered him to put Jean Bonnet down. I knelt next to her and I leaned down to her face. And Jean leaned down opposite me, and um, his face was just inches from mine. And we had a nonverbal exchange that I will never forget. And he asked if she was dead. And I said, yes, she's dead. And I told him to go back to the room and to dial 911. And as we looked at each other, I remember, and I wore a shoulder holster, tucking my gun right next to me and consciously counting, I've got 18 bullets. Why did you do that? Because I didn't know if we'd all be alive when people showed up. I said that everything made sense in that instance. And uh, I knew what happened. Do you think your fear was well-founded? You bet I do. There's no doubt in my mind. To this day? Never wavered. You were afraid because you thought the killer was still in the house. I knew it. Absolutely? Absolutely. 1.10 p.m., Detective Arndt moved John Bonet's body from the hallway to the living room. John Ramsey came back into the living room and he grabbed a throw that was on the back of a chair. And he says, can we please, could you please cover her body? And as he's saying it, he's already put the blanket on top of her. Arndt would later be harshly criticized for two so, key decisions, asking John Ramsey to search the house and allowing John Ramsey to place the blanket on John Bonet's body. You had to know that that was going to contaminate evidence. John Bonet's body was in and of itself a crime scene. Would it be nice if John hadn't found Jean Bonnet? Absolutely. And would it be nice if he hadn't put a blanket? Yeah, it would be great. And it would be nice if there were other people to help control and keep people away. That would have been wonderful. But that's not the circumstances that I had available that day. Still alone in the living room with John Ramsey, Arndt then heard Patsy Ramsey's voice. And I heard a wail, just a guttural moan, aching wail from the back area. It's probably one of the most pitiful things I've ever heard and anguished. And I saw the rest of the people, the Patsy and the pastor and the four friends, come from the den towards the living room. So I said, if you want to say goodbye to Jean Bonnet, this is the only time you'll have to do it. And, uh, oh, there's just so much. There's so much pain. And I called 911. I get my radio number. And I said, the kidnapping has turned into a murder. This house had suddenly become a homicide crime scene. Oh, it became hell. Jean Bonnet was brought up at about five minutes after one. And um, at 10 after one, nobody had shown up. And I looked out the window to the street and I saw an ambulance slowly drive by. And I thought, I am in the twilight zone. Meanwhile, the pastor led the Ramseys and their friends in prayer in the living room, holding hands as Jean Bonnet's body lay before them. I thought that would be the best way to organize everyone, to keep them distracted, to keep them from touching Jean Bonnet, and to keep them focused on something other than, other than looking at Jean Bonnet. 
1.20 p.m., after three hours as the only officer on what Arndt calls an incredibly tense crime scene, and 20 minutes after John Benet's body was found, backup finally arrived. The next day, the autopsy on John Benet was conducted. Linda Arndt was there. I hadn't seen savagery to, done to a child or even an adult until uh, the doctor peeled back her scalp and uh, saw that hor horrific uh, fracture to her head. It was the length of her head. It was eight and a half inches long, and there was something else even more disturbing. She had trauma to her vagina. vagina. What kind of trauma? It would be trauma that would be consistent with uh, injuries seen in sexual assault cases. Recently? I guess the best way to say that was what was seen was not a first time injury. The coroner, in fact, said the evidence was inconclusive. But ABC News has confirmed that three medical experts who consulted for the Boulder Police Department concluded the injuries were consistent with prior sexual abuse. As the Ramsey investigation dragged on for weeks, then months, and then years, the criticism of Linda Arndt's actions that December day continued. But she still defends her actions, saying she has become a scapegoat for a flawed investigation. And Linda Arndt remains convinced that she knows who killed John Benet Ramsey. She will not say the killer's name, but has no doubt that justice will never be done. Do you think this person will ever be indicted, will ever be charged or convicted? No. What you're saying is, whoever killed John Benet will get away with murder. Yes. That was 1999. In June of 2001, a federal judge dismissed her lawsuit, saying Arndt failed to prove the police chiefs violated her First Amendment rights. Stay tuned to ABC News Now and abcnews.com for the latest information. That's all for this special edition of Time Tunnel. Now back to the present with ABC News.